today is really a tribute to what we started. Um, whether you wondered why we why we changed some things up and began to form a, a leadership group and out of that form teams, you need to know that this is one of the results of that. Um, this is the result of people uh, thinking out of the box and talking about it and people helping and serving. That's why we were able to do today. So it's a reminder uh, why we did what we did because it allowed this type of an event to happen. This also would not be possible without some really good friends of mine who I called in a really huge favor and said, is there any chance I can borrow tables out of your church? Uh, Indian Old Freedom Fellowship uh, with Jeff Rabe and now Ben Segabart, also on staff, they're helping. Uh, they have really been willing to partner and help and encourage. And, you know, we just don't have coffee every Tuesday morning to uh, write to talk about how much we can't stand our church people. We actually talk about constructive things. And how do we help one another and serve one another? And really this morning is a testimony to what partnership does and looks like. So I'm um, really so appreciative of everybody who helped. But you've got to remember our, our teams are so important. How many people served and did things to make this happen is really, really important and really, really vital. And I just want to make sure all of you understand that up front, how important it is. Because, um, you know, I, there's, we just have limited ideas. When people come up with ideas and other people run with them and you see what can happen and what can take place. So for all the ladies in the room, I hope you really feel loved and appreciated. For those watching online, we're glad you're tuned in for this. And in the room, we, it looks really different than a normal Sunday. And that was our opportunity to honor and celebrate uh, you and all you are and all that you do for our church. So that's what this is about. So if you allow me a few moments to talk this morning, uh, for all the ladies in the room, this is going to be kind of directed towards you, and I, I'm going to do my best. I, I, I will tell you up front, I don't like speaking on Mother's Day because I, I don't understand, and I, I don't, and you might walk away going, what does he know about being a mom? Zero. In fact, if we could just put a negative integer on that, okay? I don't know anything. I'm, I'm just going to try to tell you what I've heard, what I've experienced, and what I want to encourage you in this morning. So here's what I've noticed. Simple question. You ever been asked this question, how are you doing? Uh, it's a typical question I might ask on a Wednesday night, talking to some of our leaders, or on a Sunday morning at the door, how are you doing, okay? And, and your face says, right, one thing, and, and you just kind of muscle up some words, and it's normally, I'm fine, which means I'm getting by, I am surviving, I am trying to get through another week. Rarely do any of you women stop me and say, gosh, Ed, I'm crushing it, okay? My kids, now, my kids are just like perfect. They do exactly what I want, and my husband just does everything. It's amazing. I, I don't hear that very often, okay? And it's not that your kids are all bad. It's not your husband's not doing what he's supposed to. Life is hard and difficult, and what I knew you didn't need today was, Here's another checklist of stuff you're probably not doing and heap a bunch of guilt and shame on you and you walk away going, I'm a terrible mother, right? I'm a terrible wife. I'm a terrible woman. I did not want that. And so that went into what could I say? Where could I take people? Where could I help and encourage you today? So what does God want to say to you where you are at? That's the question. That's the question I had this week when I was going, okay, I think what I had before was terrible, scrap it. Um, what can we say? What does God want to say to you where you are at? That's what I tried to think about. So in doing that, I ran across, and, and it really was a memory from something I saw in The Chosen. If you've not seen The Chosen, uh, this summer during Wednesdays, we're actually going to watch season one and have some discussion times after that. This would be season one, episode two. And they are having what is called Shabbat dinner, Sabbath dinner. And it is Friday night, because that's how the Jewish timetable works, okay? Friday night, sunset, to Saturday night sunset, that is your Sabbath. And there's all sorts of things you don't do on Sabbath. But one of the things you did was on Friday night, and you worked hard because when it came to sunset, you were done, you were done working, you would have a big dinner. And that dinner, people would be invited to that dinner. That would be a family dinner. And there's something that happened at that dinner that I'm watching on The Chosen, and I'm like, I didn't know that. 
I never knew that took place. I never knew what that passage was about. And it's really Proverbs 31. Now, when I say that, some of you just go, oh, no, Proverbs 31. Because I asked a couple of you this. Hey, what do you think of Proverbs 31? Oh, it's a perfect woman. I'm not that, right? It's, it's the woman that God would create, and I'm not that either, okay? It, it's like the most godly woman ever. It's, it's like this, this standard that oh, I'll never match up to. But in the show, The Chosen, on Shabbat dinner, the husband would stand up, and he would say this to his wife. Now, I'm thinking, wait a minute, if this happened in the home every Friday night, what, a month, two months, right? And it's, shut up, don't say it again, I feel belittled, I feel, right? That would never be said, that would just be stopped. But every Friday night, the husband would stand up, and he would read these words. And if it's just a checklist, if it's just, you know, this this ode to the perfect woman, I, I don't think they would be saying it every Friday night. I think the woman at home would say, okay, you need to stop. So what is it all about? I want you to know it's not a checklist. And if you've ever read Proverbs 31 or ever had it or ever read it, ever read a blog about it, ever, and you thought that's what it was, it was a checklist, then no, no, no. I mean, could you imagine that every Friday night? Oh, no. How bad they do this week? Let's pull out the checklist. Fail, 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 right? Average. I mean, Why would we ever read that passage of scripture? You start to understand why this passage is going to kind of been pushed away because of the way it makes you feel. But if it was read every Friday night, I don't think it would do that. I don't think it would be a part of that type of society. It's it's also not the portrait of a superwoman. I almost put Wonder Woman because she's actually Jewish, whether you knew that or not, okay? Uh, So I almost put that. It's not that either. It's not that. That's not what this is talking about. And so I'd like to kind of introduce you to it again today. And it has to do with these words. And if I I murdered this in Hebrew, I'm sorry. Uh, This is always hard. But it's called Ashit Shayel. Okay? Ashit Hayel. That's how you say this. Ashit Hayel. Proverbs 31.10 says, Who can find a wife of noble character? That phrase, wife of noble character, in the Hebrew is two words, ashit hayel. That's where it is. And in the Hebrew language, they do something very interesting that we don't do. When they repeat a phrase, it's really important. Like if they repeat a phrase, you can go back and say, where does it appear? Because it might have something to do with where it is. So if you went to Proverbs 31.10 and you found this phrase, you could say, does it ever appear in the Old Testament other than this place? And if it does, does it tell us something about this passage? Well, guess what? In one place in the Hebrew Scripture, it appears after Proverbs 31.10, really before that. And here it is. Everyone in the village, this is Boaz speaking to a woman by the name of Ruth. Everyone in the village knows that you are what? A sheet hayel. You are a worthy woman. See, even if I read that in English, I wouldn't know they're the same thing. But they're two, and they're the only two places they ever appear. So could it be that this is not a checklist, but a reminder for everybody? That it's a reminder back to where it came from in the book of Ruth. It's not a checklist. That What actually Solomon do, is doing is not saying, uh, because, right, he had a few women, a few hundred women, Okay, so he's not saying, why 542? Gosh, I landed it with you, but I was terrible with everybody else. Okay, he's not doing that. He's actually going back and he's saying, let me tell you about my great, great grandmother and who she was and what God did in her life. And this is actually can be seen as a portrait of who Ruth was and what God has done in her life. Mind or what God can do in your life as well. The story of Ruth. If you haven't done it, I would urge you to read this through. It is four chapters. If you've never read through the story, it's an incredible story. So let me take a few moments this morning and do a little recap if I can. The little recap is that in the book of Ruth, it opens up with a man by name of Elimelech. He is married to a woman by name of Naomi. They have two sons, Malon and Kilion. Now, 
if I had thought they'd live nowadays, I thought the guy, that Abimelech watched too much Star Trek, and he was looking for Klingon names, okay? Because those are just weird, right? Malon and Kilion, that's, that's who they named their kids. And there is a famine in Bethlehem. So they decide to leave Bethlehem, go outside the realm of Israel, and go to a place called Moab. And Jewish people never went to Moab. They didn't worship God. They worshiped a God by the name of Chemosh. And you made certain sacrifices to Chemosh, including child sacrifices. They weren't supposed to live there, but they went there. And while they were there, the two sons, Malon and Kilion, marry Ruth and a woman by the name of Orpah. That's who they marry. And then tragedy strikes this family. We're not told what happened. We're just told that it happened. Elimelech dies. Malon dies. Kilion dies. Now you have three women. And three women back then had no resources, no opportunities. They were in deep trouble living there because of the tragedy that struck their family. So what are they going to do? What, what are we going to do? And Naomi could go back and say, okay, in the Jewish world, God took care of this. There are certain laws or certain rules so that when I end up a widow and, and I end up, a, a, you know, uh, a widow, I, can, I have some options. And so she decides to go back. And Orpah and Ruth decide, well, I'm gonna go, we're going to go with you. And about somewhere on the journey, she stops and says, what are you doing? I, can't, I have nothing for you. I can't do anything for you. And so she tries to urge them to go back. Orpah automatically goes back. Ruth makes this incredible statement, nope, your God, Naomi, your God's my God. I'm going with you. I, I'm not leaving your side. I am with you. And she makes this incredible commitment. She's going to go with them. So they go back to Bethlehem. Now, now they're in Bethlehem. What are we going to do? And so Ruth knows and is told probably by Naomi that, the, uh, that God has made provision for people who need food, uh, for people who are in the condition they are in. And that was that they could go out, and you were supposed to leave certain parts of your fields untouched, okay? You couldn't harvest them. And it was an invitation to those, uh, the poor, the widow, the orphan, to come, and you could collect out of that field. So guess what Ruth does? She gets up early in the morning, and she heads off. She heads off to the field and begins to work and begins to bring them food. The field she ends up in is a field by the name of Boaz. And this makes Naomi really excited because according to God's law, Boaz is in this line where he can come in and he can marry Ruth and he can redeem everything. And that's what they think is going to happen. This is going to be great. God has provided. This is awesome. Naomi tells her, Ruth, you need to stay there. Stay there. Um, something good's going to happen. So you get to chapter 3, and we don't know how much time has elapsed, but time's elapsed, and Boaz hasn't done anything, Okay. And that's got him nervous. What are we going to do? And so Naomi tells Ruth to act in a certain way so that she can uh, tell Boaz, I want you to redeem us. And Boaz stops her and says, yeah, but there's someone else before me. We'll just say there's a first cousin before Boaz who might be a second cousin uh, to Malon. And he has the right to get stuff first. So Boaz works it out with him. And he, and he negotiates. And he redeems everything. He marries Ruth. He redeems the land. Naomi is brought in and cared for and loved. And the story is incredible of what God does. And at the end of the story, we're told that Ruth and Boaz have a son. The son's name is Obed, which I'm guessing we've never heard of reading our Bible. But we have heard of Obed's son. His name is Jesse. And then Jesse had a son whose name is David. And so isn't it amazing what God does and David has a son by name of Solomon and Solomon looks back and says what can we learn about my great great grandmother and her story and God's goodness in our life um, when tragedy strikes when we don't know what to do that God is there working on our behalf what if every Friday night the reading of this took him back to that and what if it reminded him of that it wasn't just a checklist it wasn't, um, hey, wife, how'd you do this week being super mom? Bad, right? You just, it didn't do that. It wasn't supposed to. It wasn't meant to do that. And unfortunately, in our day, not knowing what, what Scripture tells us, not knowing the background, 
That's what we've turned it into, unfortunately. We've turned it into a checklist, and why most of you women uh, don't ever read it, don't ever want to read it, or like, oh, no, he's not reading that passage today, is he? Oh, no, right? Because that's how you've heard it before. This is the perfect wife. This is the perfect mom. Uh, go do it. And you're like, do you understand how much is going on? Do you understand I'm trying to get by in my week? Do you understand how much pressure is on me? Do you understand how much is going on in my life? And no, I probably don't. And I want you to know that this passage does not do it to you. And if, if it's ever done it before, please use today to say, that's not what this passage is for. That's not what Proverbs 31 is. It's a reminder back to how God works in somebody's life and God will work in your life as well. No matter where you are, no matter what your story is, he would love to work in your life. So if I can, can I just remind you some simple lessons that you get out of the book of Ruth? And you might get four. I would urge you to read it. You might collect more. But I collected a few just to, just to help you understand how rich and how great this story is of what God wants to do in our lives. The first, your past is not a determination for what God can and will do in your life. Think about it. If this was the portrait, do you understand this? Proverbs 31, is, if it's the portrait of a perfect Jewish woman, do you know something about Ruth? She's not Jewish. Oops. Okay, uh, Solomon's saying it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if she was born in Moab. It doesn't matter that she grew up worshiping a, a, an idol, a false god. That didn't matter. Her past didn't matter. It is not a determination for you. And too often, let it be a determination for us. Well, if I wasn't divorced, maybe God could use me. Well, if my, you know, if my kids were better behaved, if, 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 if. And we start to view our past as a determination for what God can do in the life. It's not. And it's clear in the story of Ruth. And maybe they were reminded of that every Friday night. Oh, that's right. That's right. This week was rough and hard. But that's not a determination of what God can and will do in a life. If you've allowed it to be, would today you understand that God loves you, he has redeemed you, he is working in your life, and that is not a determination. And don't allow it to be a determination of what God can do and will do in your life. Second, what happened to you isn't what defines you. What happened to you isn't what defines you. Otherwise, Ruth would have just been like, well, my husband died. I, I, I'm done. I can't do anything. I don't know what to do. And, and you read it a little bit in Naomi. She's starting to think this way. Except, oh, God has made provisions. God has taken care of us. And here is Ruth who comes alongside and says, no, I'm not leaving you. We're, we're in this together. And no, we're not letting what happened to our husbands define us. We are not letting them tell us that this is the entire story of our life. What happened to you, as tragic as it might have been, as hard as it might have been, as sinful as it might have been against you, is not what defines you. It's not what God looks at and says and sees first. He sees something totally different. And I want to make sure you understand that. Could it be every Friday night? Darren, oh, yeah. Yeah, this was a rough week. Had some pretty low moments this week. But that doesn't define who I am. That does not say who I am. And God does not look at that and say, oh, that's the first characteristic I see of who they are. Number three, God is always at work even when we can't see it or feel it. Naomi, at one point, she changes her name because she's so upset. She's so upset, she changes her name because she doesn't want to hear the name Naomi anymore. I don't want to hear it. Call me something else because God has just dealt harshly with me. Uh, God just doesn't like me. God's been against me. She forgot that God would be at work behind the scenes the whole time. And Ruth, well, I don't know. I, I've just learned about God from you, and I'm all in, but I have no idea who this God is. And they had no idea that he's putting all this together. Please don't think that Ruth just wandered into the right field without God working behind the scenes of all of this, right? And, and Boaz is just absolutely prepared to care for her, to step up, to be who he needs to be. 
that Boaz is in the position that he is in order to do what God has pleased. I don't think we understand. You are in the position you were in. You are at the place you're in because God would love to use you in that place. He would love to use you. Now, I know you want, man, we, you could give me the, the list of all the things you want different. But God has you where you are and would love to use you where you are. And he's at work. You probably can't see it. You probably definitely can't feel it. And you're about ready to just quit, throw in the towel. He is at work. Even in your kids. He is at work. In your house. In your family. In your husband's lady. He is at work. Trust what he's doing. You probably can't see it. Definitely can't feel it. But I'm trying to get you to understand, what if every Friday night they were like, wow, God's still at work. Even in my lousy week. Even my kids decided they're not going to college, and that's what I thought was going to happen. And they made different decisions than I wanted them to make. And, and they're with another guy. I didn't want them to be with them. And another girl, and I didn't want her to be with him or her. And you don't know what to do. What if God is at work, even when we can't see it or feel it, and every Friday night they got reminded of that? Oh, hey, God's at work, even when you can't see it, even when you can't feel it. The fourth redemption is for everyone and only from God. That's the word used in this story, redeem. It's buy back. What was taken, what was stolen, gets bought back. That is, that is one of the incredible words in the Old Testament, is this concept of redeem. We ran into it last year with the story of Abraham, where Lot gets taken away and Abraham could have gone, I told you not to go live in Sodom. Good luck, Lot. Hey, I told you. And he doesn't do that. He looks and he says, it's my job. I, 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 I'm the head of the household. I, I, I'm, I'm the person looking out for him. My job. So he goes and he gets guys together and he goes and he brings everything back. That's redemption. That's what God would love to do in your life. He would love to restore what has been broken. He'd love to put back together what has stolen or taken from you. But that's, what, that's only what God can do. Now, I would like to manipulate it at times, right, and see if I can do it, see if I can wiggle my way. Okay, God, I got this, okay? You just, okay, God, well, you need to do it this way, okay? If you provide me with this much money, this will, this will connect the dot here. And we think, we know how we want God to do it. But if we trust the story and know that redemption is from him, what if he put this all together and did something incredible in the midst of it? So. Using a couple of probably two or three different bloggers, um, I, I have found a modern day, a sheet kayel. So this will, uh, if I read Proverbs 31, you're going to be like, uh, when's the last time I, I went on a ship? And, and you, you could just not connect the dots maybe very well. So I've tried to find a very uh, modern version, some, some ladies who, who love this passage and who have blogged, put something together. So as I read this today, Okay, not a checklist, not what I'm not, what I'm supposed to do, what I'm not supposed to do. Okay, I want you to hear this. This is what I want you to hear. In Christ, you are loved, you are redeemed, you are enough. Don't read this and go, oh, I'm terrible. Nope. In Christ, you are loved, you are redeemed, you are enough. And if I had to stop reading this halfway through and say it, I will say it again. Because I'd love all you ladies to know this. In Christ, you are loved, you are redeemed, you are enough. Just let that sink into you as you hear what is a modern take on this whole thing called the Sheet Hayal, uh, Proverbs 31. Who can find a confident, kind-hearted, virtuous woman for her price is far above anything this world can offer? Her husband loves her with all his whole heart, and because he married a smart woman, he trusts her to completely run the household, and he still, look, still looks at her like they were dating. She loves him with her whole heart, forgiving him of his faults, encouraging his talents, and refusing to husband bash when with her friends, and always remembering that he is a son of God. During the day, she Googles how to get stains out of her daughter's brand new jeans. 
wipes the toddler's tray for the 50th time, and balances the budget. She runs errands, gets kids to doctor's appointments, and goes food shopping at Costco to stock up on goldfish and chicken nuggets. During the night, when she just wants to curl up in bed and sleep, she packs lunches for tomorrow, irons clothes for tomorrow's workday, and wonders how long her eldest will continue to call. She also remembers to put the clothes to donate in the trunk of her car so she doesn't forget it again. She works hard to multiply what life gives her so it will be enough and more for her family. She is a wise steward of all her resources. She is strong and uses her strength to give a voice to the voiceless in her community. She doesn't waste her time or emotional energy comparing her life to others. Pinterest or Instagram does not define her self-worth. She takes time for self-care, enjoying hobbies that enrich, beautify her family's home, and creates space, uh, and, and which creates space for even mom to make mistakes, learn, and grow. She recognizes the abundance of her blessing most of the time and generously shares her talents, compassion, and material resources with others. She uses her education to bless her family. Her husband and children support her continued education. She is wise in how she talks about her body. She knows little ears hear and sometimes mimic body shaming feelings or talk. Her husband talks respectfully about her and she him and neither uses each other as a punchline of a joke, and everyone knows that they know that. She works hard with her hands, her head, and her heart to bless her family and others. She has a village she can call on in time of needs. Her countenance radiates strength and goodness. She is striving to allow her faith to overcome her fears of the future. It is easy for her to give compliments, and she repents when she realizes she said something unkind, about another. She keeps her children and husband close to her heart and knows when to work and when to play. She watches her children grow up and regardless of the path they choose, they know she loves them. Her husband appreciates all that she has done to nurture her children and tells her often. Many women hold master's degrees and will walk into Fortune 500 companies sporting their high heels and business suits. But you are just as important sporting your PJs with spit up smeared on the front, rocking your little ones and reading a story. Being hashtag on trend and staying out of pictures because your hair and makeup outfit doesn't look the best is lame and you know this. It's a woman who focuses instead on feeding her soul where true beauty is found in God's eyes. When you see a good woman, speak it. We rise by lifting others. God everything she does and loves her relentlessly. In Christ, you are loved, you are redeemed, you are enough. I pray you heard that today. And I pray you would allow that to work in your life and that God would speak in this encouragement and blessing and honor today. So let me pray for you. We want to close with a song of worship together and we appreciate you being here. Father, I really trust that this morning has been a time of honoring and blessing. Not a time of guilt. Not a time of comparison. Not a time of, oh, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm not what I'm supposed to be. Instead of the encouragement and blessing of you working in and through their lives. I pray, Father, every woman here feels honored and blessed and feels loved, loved by you. They are your daughter, and you love them. You've created them. You have blessed them. You've given them gifts and talents and abilities. And I pray for every woman in here who believes she's not enough. In Christ, she is. And I pray that would break through the voices that keep downplaying and pushing down and being negative to what is happening in their life. I pray, Father, you would help them understand where you've put them and placed them, and you would work in an incredible way in and through their life. And again, Father, I pray 
They feel honored and blessed this morning and deeply loved for all that they have done and all that you are doing through in and through them. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. We will have our prayer team this morning. Kim, where do you where are you going to be? Over here. Okay, like normal. So our prayer team over here, if, if anything you want to pray about, um, you can come up during the last song, and uh, they'd love to pray with you. Um, and we appreciate that. We just encourage you to join in for worship.